Hey, APCAM. We have two basic topics to talk about when, as we're finishing up kinetics. And it's really, both of these really relate to the energy behind kinetics. So we're kind of going to merge energy and kinetics a little bit um, in very careful ways, because like we talked about in our thermodynamics chapter, it's really important to separate thermodynamics or the energy of a reaction with kinetics or the speed of the reaction, right? So just because you know that a reaction is spontaneous doesn't say anything about the speed in which the reaction occurs. So we talked about how it's really important to keep those two, uh, those two concepts separate. And that's still true. We're not changing that at all. What we want to talk about now is um, the, the energy behind kinetics that we can talk about. Um, and this gets us into two things, activation energy and catalysts. Okay, so let's talk about these two things. Um, so we know that a reaction is going to come with energy changes, right? And we've talked about how these energy changes um, look on a graph. So if I give you the reactants, let's say the reactants are at a specific energy level here, right? And we talked about how usually you have to put energy in in order to break bonds. And so this would really be the intermediates. Whether the intermediates are our initial molecules pulled apart into atoms or into ions or formed into these intermediate complexes or molecules, some energy has to go in in order to form these intermediates. And then when the bonds, when the new bonds form, we get energy back out, right? And if it's an endothermic reaction, we end somewhere here so that our energy difference is positive. If it's an exothermic reaction, then our products would be farther down and the difference between reactants and products is going to be a negative number, right? Energy is going to be given off by the system. So we've talked about this graph before, um, but we've never really talked about what... Here, let me erase one of these so that it's a little bit more clear. I'm going to erase the endothermic one and leave the exothermic one. Okay, we never have really talked about what this energy is, right? We've talked about what this energy is. That's the energy that either has to be, it's like the delta H of the reaction. That's the energy that either has to be absorbed by the system um, as the reaction proceeds forward, or it's the energy that's given off by the system as the reaction proceeds forward. But what's this energy? That's what we're going to talk about today. And that energy is called activation energy. Okay, so we have energy, we have time, we have our reactants, we have our products, we have the difference, the total enthalpy of the reaction. Um, but the question is, what keeps the ball from rolling down the hill? So, so to speak, if reactants are at higher energy and products are at lower energy, like we see, for example, when we have a mixture of oxygen and hydrogen, right? We know the mixture of elemental oxygen and elemental hydrogen is at a higher energy level. It's at a more unstable, it's a more unstable system then when the two react together and form water, right? Uh, when this reaction proceeds forward, it's an extremely exothermic reaction. Things burn. They, it's so exothermic, we can see the energy it's given off. That's what we call a flame, right? And then what we result in, the product of this reaction is a much more stable system. It's a much lower energy system, right? So why doesn't oxygen and hydrogen spontaneously combust 
and form water? Why doesn't that happen? What keeps the ball from rolling down the hill? And that's exactly what we're talking about. It's the activation energy. In order for this reaction to occur, you need a match, right? You need a match that you can put energy into and it'll light. And this provides the initial energy we need in order to get the ball rolling, in order to start the reaction. And then as the reaction goes and releases energy, that released energy can start the next molecules reacting, which release energy, which can be used to start the next reaction from happening. So can start the next reaction happening. So we get a feedback loop, right? Um, but we need this initial input of energy in order to start the reaction. We need the in initial input of energy to separate these things into their atoms or their ions or form complexes intermediate complexes, right? Whatever needs to happen inside the mechanism for this reaction to actually proceed forward is going to take some initial energy and then give off energy, which can get the next cycle running. Well, that initial input of energy is called activation energy. We can see this really clearly if we look at, oh, and this is, these are the symbols for activation energy. It's a capital E with a lowercase a. That means activation energy. Okay, so it's really easy to visualize in this picture, right? We have ball A, which is at one certain energy level. And then that ball A, if it if it rolls down the hill, it's going to be at a lower energy, a more stable system, right? But what's keeping the ball from rolling down the hill, well, initial energy has to be put in to get the ball to the top of the hill first. And that's not going to happen all by itself. It needs an initial input of energy in order to proceed forward. And this initial input of energy is what we're going to call activation energy. Okay, so you can see it here. Here's another example. We have our reactants. And then we have three activated complexes. These are our intermediates. Um, our activated complexes, again, they're not there initially. They're not a reactant. They're not there finally. They're not a product. They're going to be made in one step of the mechanism and used in another step of the mechanism. So when you add all the steps of the mechanism together, these activated complexes are what reduce out of the equation so that we're just left with our reactants and our products. And again, you can say, see, this is a similar situation. It's an exothermic reaction overall, but before this giant release of energy can occur, right? We need this initial input of energy in order to form these activated complexes. Um, okay, so, so this is what activation energy is. Now the activation energy can be changed by a couple different things, right? So this activation energy can represent a couple different ideas, right? Maybe this is, this represents how hard these molecules have to collide. If they collide with, um, for example, hydrogen and oxygen, elemental hydrogen and oxygen, if they collide with a gentle 10 kilojoules of energy. I don't know if that's gentle or not. Okay, let's pretend it is. If they collide with 10 kilojoules of energy, they're just gonna bounce off of each other, right? It's not enough energy to actually smash the molecules apart into its components, which can then react to form the products, right? You need to raise the 
energy of the collision. How do we raise the energy of collision for hydro elemental hydrogen and oxygen? We light a match, right? An increased temperature means those molecules are going to go faster and hit each other harder. And so that increase in energy that we have just given our system will then be enough for them to smash into each other, cause these activated complexes, which can then react and form the products, right? So it could represent that. It could represent like a necessary energy for molecules to react. It could represent an orientation problem, right? So maybe uh, molecules are reacting and bouncing off of each other and these molecules just keep bouncing off each other because they never get oriented into the right direction. This can happen a lot in um, the case of biological systems, right? So let's say um, in order for a molecule to attach to a certain part of the membrane of a cell, right? It has to orient into the right position. If there is a like triangle shaped hole in the membrane, well, the triangle shaped part of the molecule has to uh, hit at the right spot in order for this complex to be made and the process to proceed forward. And if the molecule doesn't hit in that triangle shaped spot, the, the two can never come together and proceed forward, right? So it could be an orientation problem. Um, and so if it's an orientation problem or an energy problem or a location problem or any of these things, there's a couple things we can do to lower the activation energy. And one of the things we can do that'll affect the activation energy is a catalyst. So remember when we watched that um, super cute video that I love and adore on how to speed up a chemical reaction and get a date to your dance, right? There are five things we can do in order to speed up the reaction. Some of them being normal controls that we've already talked about, like an increase of concentration, which is going to cause more collisions to happen or um, a decrease in space or volume, which kind of has the same effect. Okay. But there's a couple of things we really haven't talked about how they speed up a reaction yet. And one of them is a catalyst. So that was the matchmaker in the video. Um, chemically speaking, a catalyst is, is something that's involved with the reaction, but it's not a product. It's not a reactant. It's not there in the beginning. It's not there in the end. Well, it's the same in the beginning and the end. It's not changed chemically through the process, right? And what a catalyst does is it affects one of these factors in order to lower the activation energy. Okay, so let me show you a couple of examples of these. Um, so here's an example of like what, why collision orientation matters. So for example, if we have the chlorine chlorine sides of the molecules collide, um, that's going to be an effective collision because your products apparently are a chlorine, uh, elemental chlorine molecule and nitrogen monoxide. But if that chlorine atom hits the oxygen side of the molecule, Notice nothing actually occurs. They just bounce off each other and go their merry way. So um, it's just a good image of why collision orientation matters. Okay, we're going to get to temperature in just a second. I'm going to show you catalyst. Uh, well, shoot. Hold on. Okay, we'll talk about temperature. We'll return to that. That's going to be point number two for lowering activation energy. Okay, but point number one, one way that you can lower activation energy is using a catalyst. So notice here it's, uh, we have it represented graphically. You can see the initial activation energy and by using a catalyst, we have just lowered the activation energy. Um, so on a graph, it would look like this. It doesn't change your starting energy. It doesn't change your ending energy. 
it just lowers that initial input of energy you need to get the, the reaction started, get the ball rolling. And this is why kinetics are separate from thermodynamics, right? Thermodynamics are looking at the overall energy of the reaction. Notice that's untouched. That's not changed at all. What's changed is the activation energy required, and that's going to affect the speed of the reaction, not the overall thermodynamics of the reaction. So that's why these two concepts are separated. They affect different parts of this energy graph. Okay, now Practically, here's a couple examples of what a catalyst can do on a practical level of how they uh, lower this activation energy. Okay, so one of them is they can provide like a reaction site. And that's what we're seeing in this slide. Notice that this thing right here, whatever this complex is, it kind of looks like a simple protein, right? Notice it's unchanged throughout this sequence. It starts and continues and continues and continues, and it ends exactly the same as it started. But it facilitates the reaction. So in this example, these red things are, are active sites. And so a hydrogen can be, hydrogen molecule can be attracted to one. This molecule, which is probably ethene, can be attracted to the other. And, and somehow this protein facilitates, it attracts it to a location that's close enough where these two can actually react. Sometimes what proteins do is they attract these two molecules. And then once they have each molecule bond, the protein actually folds and the reaction occurs. And then when the molecule is released, the protein unfolds again. Uh, and so in that way, the protein could be acting as a catalyst. If we're talking about a biological system, a catalyst is called an enzyme. Uh, it, an enzyme is a biological catalyst. They're the same thing. Uh, so if you've heard that term in biology, what you've been talking about is a catalyst this whole way. So sometimes it's a location thing. It The catalyst facilitates a location, um, attracts the molecules to that specific location, and then the, the reaction can occur because the molecules are close enough. And you can imagine how attracting these two to the specific location would be a faster route than just expecting them to randomly uh, interact in uh, the solution, right? Or the environment. Um, it's kind of the same concept as a dating app, right? Are we gonna find a relationship faster if we're both drawn to the same location? Or are we gonna find a relationship faster if we're just all milling about randomly in the world and we just have to rely on happenstance? Uh, not that I'm advocating dating apps. Chemistry is very different. Inorganic chemistry is very different than relationship chemistry. I'm not advocating dating apps, but the idea is there, right? The idea is consistent. Okay, so this is one example. Another example um, you can see up here, again, it's a biological example because they're calling it an enzyme. Um, this we would call a lock and key enzyme. The idea is the same. The substrate or the, th the thing we want to change is attracted to this enzyme because it fits really well. That, thus the lock and the key. The key fits inside the lock, right? So once it, uh, once the enzyme is bonded to the substrate, then the enzyme can facilitate this reaction or the reaction can occur on its own. And then the products are ejected and the enzyme stays the same. Okay, so same idea. It's more of an orientation thing. We're fixing the orientation and therefore lowering the activation energy. Um, we see catalysts all around us. I mean, your body is full of uh, catalyst or enzyme examples. Um, if you have driven a car or driven in a car, your car 
uh, hopefully is street legal and has a catalytic converter here. So it's where exhaust from the engine goes in and then it goes through this substrate that has catalyst bonded. And what that does is the, um, the exhaust from your engine is actually catalyzed to, uh, to undergo chemical reactions that form different products that are more environmentally friendly. So that happens inside the catalytic converter. It's the big thing that is attached right before your muffler. Um, and then here's another example, um, acid catalysis. If you've ever um, done a little activity either with us in chemistry or uh, in an art class or in like a welding class where you drop metal into acid um, and then you can plate the the reaction uh, you can you can plate the metal then with something else um, what you're doing is you're using h plus you're using this h plus ion well the h plus ion can also be used as a catalyst. So one of the labs, one of our labs, we deal with potassium permanganate. And in order for the reaction to actually occur, we have to add a little H2SO4. Because H2SO4 is a super strong acid, it's going to fill our solution with H+. And what the H+, does is it allows an activated complex to occur um, faster. And then the activated complex can kind of disintegrate into your products. And actually that's what you hear see down here in this example. It's acid catalysis of an ester. And so here in the middle, you can see your reactants on this side. In the middle, you can see the um, the hydrogen is attacking this oxygen. And when it does that, it forms this, this activated complex that you see in the middle. And then the activated complex kind of falls apart into the products. Well, this would, may happen eventually to a small extent, um, but it's gonna happen a lot faster because the hydrogen kind of attacks the reactant and forms this activated complex right away right and without that hydrogen present it would have to take a totally different mechanism towards the products which might not actually happen at all or it might take years and years like thousands of years to happen um, but the fact that this hydrogen is there in the beginning and the hydrogen is there in the end, makes hydrogen a catalyst. And so this is a really common type of reaction also, an acid catalyzed reaction. Okay, so adding in a catalyst, it's not going to change your spontaneity. It's not gonna change your net intake or release of energy, but it is gonna lower that activation energy and affect the speed of your reaction. One other thing that can affect the speed, oh, while we're on the topic of catalysts, um, let me just tie it to the nitrogen cycle. So uh, if you go into like biology or biochemistry at all, your the nitrogen cycle is this huge environmentally important cycle that we have um, going on in our ecosystem. And actually it depends on catalysts. It depends on something called nitrogenase. Uh, anytime you see this ACE ending, you know the molecule is a catalyst or an enzyme. And so the um, catalysts in this reaction are, you can see all the different forms of nitrogen that this has to go through. Well, some of these chemical changes are catalyzed and the catalyst is actually bacteria. Uh, all the nitrogenases that we are aware of are prokaryotic. They are bacteria. So bacteria in the, in the system facilitates these chemical reactions that happen and allow the nitrogen cycle to be. So it's actually pretty cool. Okay, so now that we've talked about catalysts, I want to go back and talk about temperature. So temperature is the other thing that can affect 
our activation energy. Okay, so that brings us back to this graph. And this graph shows us how uh, our rate constant varies with temperature. So here's our rate constant and here's our temperature. Again, when these reactions occur, usually we say like this reaction occurs occurs at 25 degrees Celsius. And that we say, just to tell you that temperature is not gonna mess with this system at all. It's gonna be consistent because temperature is consistent and you don't have to worry about it changing. But if it changes, it's going to mess with K. And let's look at what K does. If we have a rate equals K times anything, if K goes up, rate goes up. If K goes down, rate goes down. So our rate constant can govern the speed of the reaction. If we can change our rate constant, we can change the speed of our reaction. And the rate constant varies with temperature. I want to show this to you mathematically, not because you have to memorize this equation, but because you do need to know this relationship between rate constant, the rate and activation energy. Again, the rate constant varying is going to have an effect on the speed because it affects activation energy. So let me show you mathematically that relationship. Okay, so this is the Arrhenius equation. And like I said, this is the math tie-in um, between <clears throat> the factors that govern a reaction and the rate of reaction. And it's a tie-in through K. So let's look at the relationship between rate and K. So if we have some form of the rate law, right? If K decreases, what happens to the rate? The rate decreases, right? If K increases, the rate increases. So K, being able to manipulate K, can directly affect the rate of reaction. And this is mathematically shown through the Arrhenius equation, which is on the screen. But let's talk about the limitations of the Arrhenius equation. We're going to talk through what it, what it is in just a second, but the scope of your class, uh, you don't actually have to be able to plug numbers in and chug out answers through the Arrhenius equation. The most you would have to do with this is explain um, the effect of like temperature on the rate, and then maybe describe the parts of this Arrhenius equation and how they, how they relate to the kinetic molecular theory. So let's go through what's in this equation. Okay. So we have, um, K, which is our rate constant. Um, a, we're going to come back to, so hold on to capital A for a second. E is the base E. It's the inverse of the natural log. EA is activation energy. R is everybody's favorite constant, the gas law constant. And then T is temperature. So this, actually, let me click through that real fast so that I have that labeled in words for you. Temperature, gas law constant. Notice it's a specific form of the gas law constant. Activation energy, base E. We'll talk about A in just a second. And then K is the rate constant. So this term right here, what this term does is this term describes um, the energy of the collisions and how that governs the rate of reaction. So this term that includes activation energy and temperature, uh, this relates to the energy of collisions. And that brings us to A. What is capital A? So capital A is called a frequency factor. And what capital A refers to is the collisions that occur with the correct geometry. So again, we see a beautiful tie in here between the kinetic molecular theory saying collisions have to happen with enough energy and the correct geometry in order for 
uh, reaction to occur. And we see that by manipulating these two factors, they have a direct result on the speed of a reaction. Okay, so the um, in order to understand these different parts of the reaction, like I said, you're not going to have to plug in and check out an answer, but in order to understand the effect, we really have to look at the effect of E. So let's do that quickly here. All right, so um, this term right here, if T gets bigger, what happens to that term, negative EA over RT? Well, it gets, um, it's negative, which is the conundrum, right? If it wasn't negative, the, team, the term would get smaller right? So if T gets bigger, the term actually gets less negative, right? As the denominator increases, the fraction decreases. And since the fraction is negative, it gets less negative. Okay, so what does that do for E? Let's look at that real fast. Let's look at E to the negative 1 versus e to the negative 2, right? Okay, so t getting bigger, this would be a t, a small temperature, this would be a big temperature. Okay, so let's pull out our calculators and actually do that and see what happens. Okay, so if I have a negative 2, e raised to the negative 2, I get 0.135. If I have E raised to the 1, I have 0.367. So as temperature is getting bigger, look at what's happening to this T, this E term, this whole E raised to this term. It is getting bigger. Okay. And so that has a direct effect on K, right? K is also going to get bigger, which means what happens to rate? Rate gets bigger, right? It all hinges on this uh, base E term. But basically it comes down to this. As T increases, rate increases, which is what we knew before. We had talked about this conceptually before, but here's the mathematical support for it. Okay, so that's kinetics. Ta-da! Um, now we're going to do some practice. We're going to ask some questions. We're going to review. Um, there's lots of practice in these slides for you. Work through this stuff. Again, like I said, these are not like factual uh, concepts. These are concepts that need to be built brick by brick by brick, practice by practice by practice, or question by question by question. So as you work through this practice and really think about it, your concept is going to build for you. Okay, let me know what questions you have. I'll see you in class.